Good evening. Welcome to October's Bloody Scotland Book Club. I'm Jamie Crawford. I'm a writer and broadcaster. I'm also the new chair of the board of the Bloody Scotland Festival. So you will, I'm sure, have noticed that the nights are fair drawing in. It's late October. Halloween is in a few days. November is just around the corner. A month when, I'm convinced, Scotland becomes the coldest and the wettest place on earth. Which means there's nothing for it but to embrace the darkness. Light your fire or your artificial equivalent and get stuck into a good crime novel. And we have three very good ones for you tonight. A murder in a sleepy town that you, the reader, are challenged to solve. A grisly and hallucinogenic reimagining of the ultimate Scottish crime classic. And the work of a young upstart crime writer who set out to do for Edinburgh what the legendary William McIlvanny had done for Glasgow. Now, I'm joined tonight by a stellar panel of book clubbers. Claire Mitchell QC, who called at the bar in 2003, took the silk in 2019, and perhaps most impressively of all, just appeared on Channel 4's Murder Island in 2021. <laughs> we have Anna Day, Cultural Programme Manager at Perth and Primrose Council, currently working on putting together a new festival of history for the city in February 2022. And finally, we have bookseller and all-round book expert Simon Lloyd from Waterstones. So let's get to it. We'll start tonight with The Appeal. This is a crime debut by Janice Hallett that's gone on to be a Sunday Times bestseller. The setup is familiar. A quiet town called Lockwood, the arrival of two secretive strangers, a tragic death and dark secrets that lead towards murder. But the execution of this book is incredibly unusual. A QC assigns two law students, Charlotte and Femi, to pour through emails and messages and news reports, many about the disastrous staging of a village play, to find a killer. Before we go to our panel, let's have a short reading from Janice. Hello, I'd like to read a short extract from my book, uh, The Appeal. Here goes. From Isabel Beck to Martin Hayward. Dear Martin, sorry to bother you. I couldn't speak to Helen at last night's rehearsal. Could you pass a message on, please? A new girl at work, Sam, is coming to see the play on Saturday night. I'd love her to join Fairways. She hasn't done any drama before and spent the last few years in Africa of all places. But she's got a husband and we should grab them both while they're still new to the area and friendless. She's very nice, a staff nurse in geriatrics, so a shift worker, boo. But her husband is probably the same age, 30s. And Helen has said how badly we need men, especially if we do all my sons next. This is just in case Helen speaks to them after the play, so she knows to be in full promotional mode. Thanks, Martin. Love, Izzy. From Martin Hayward to Isabel Beck. Will do. Regards. From Isabel Beck to Martin Hayward. Dear Martin, phew, thank goodness that's over. Not that I didn't love being Edith the maid, I did. But fitting rehearsals and line learning around shifts is like trying to live two lives at the same time. Anyway, Sam loved the play. I don't think they're regular theatre goers because she asked if we'd written it. I explained it was by Noel Coward. Helen spoke to Sam and her husband, Kel Kelly, and if anyone can convince them to join, she can. Wasn't Helen an absolute shining star? All my friends remarked on how brilliant she was. No one knows how she manages to chair the fairway players, run the Grange and still learn all those lines. She must have a lot of support from you, Martin. Do send my best wishes to Paige and James. You were all so busy last night, I didn't get a chance to speak to you. What a lovely family. Thanks again. And let's hope Sam and Kel become fairway players for the next production. Love, Izzy. From Martin Hayward to Isabel Beck. Thanks. Regards. Thank you very much. So I'm going to come to you uh, first, Claire because you suggested this for the book club. How did you come across this book? Well, strangely, I was 
heading up in my camper van to Orkney to do to do a court case. I, I decided rather than to like fly up and just do the court case and come back, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of get in my camper van and I'll go slowly up the road. And I got to Dornock Bookshop and there's a great coffee machine outside Dornock Bookshop. So I was stretching my legs in the morning, go to get the coffee. And then of course you're just inside the bookshop. And I saw the, the cover and it was like, you know, it was about an appeal and I'm an appellate lawyer. I, I, I do um, uh, cases of miscarriage of justice. So as soon as I saw the appeal, my eyes went to it. And then it said, will you be able to solve the murder? And I was like, well, I'm going to have to buy this. There's, <laughs> there's literally no way that I can let this go. And in fact, the weather wasn't that good on the way up. So I, you know, read it on the ferry on the way across pitched up, um, was there for a couple of days beforehand, and I just, I, I inhaled it. I just read it like I would read court papers um, because it has that same sort of feel to it because of the very interesting way it's written. So, yeah, it was by happenstance that I came across it, but um, it was really, really good that I did. Well, I, th I mean, I think it'd be good for you to explain how it, it, it's it been written in a way because, I mean, it, it strikes me that reading it for you must have been a bit of a busman's holiday. <laughs> because it's a very, very unusual novel, unlike anything I have ever, ever read, actually. It, it totally was. And I enjoy my job. I enjoy, I'm very, very nosy. So <laughs> you know, reading people's emails and texts, I'm up for that. Um, but what was so interesting about, what is so interesting about it is the book is in a format where it, it, there isn't a narrative. It just starts off with emails and you're straight into it. And that's exactly the way if you get a paper's in an appeal case or a criminal trial, that's exactly what you get. Nobody explains a story or a narrative to you. You know what someone's charged with. You just start reading the papers. And that's exactly what happens here. There's a series of emails. Every now and then, but, but used very sparingly, you hear two law students talk to one another about what they think about it. And that's quite helpful, I think, to to get your thoughts together to see whether or not you're thinking things in the right direction. Um, the most There's only one unrealistic bit about this book and it's the idea that the QC has all the information first <laughs> and, the, the, and the trainees don't. It's always the other way around. The trainees are always telling you, look at this page, what do you think of that? So um, that's only a very gentle and, and really comedic criticism of it that the QC appeared to have the upper hand. I mean, uh, just for, for full disclosure, way back in the mist of time, I was a law student. Ah. And I have to say that reading this for me was slightly triggering because it was like <laughs> a law exam, but a really, really long one. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and I suppose, you know, I, in my, in my own way, I did a law degree, you practice law. We've got two people here who don't practice law, who have not done law degrees. Anna, I wonder, what did you make of this? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've got quite mixed feelings about it so I would never have picked this book up because I hate the cover and that whole co cozy crime is quite I wouldn't it's not something I would buy having said that there's lots of things I really enjoyed about it it did feel even with someone who's never done a law degree has you know never worked in the law it did feel like hard work at times it wasn't something you could take to your bed and just kind of you know dissolve into and enjoy but having said all that, it was quite funny in places. Um, all the characters are just awful. I quite like some of her techniques where you never hear from two of the main characters. So that's quite interesting. So you're left to form an opinion about these people and un, sort of unpick them without ever actually hearing from them until I think quite late, one of them sort of comes on the scene. So. Um, so that I thought was really interesting. Um, would I recommend it to people, which is probably where I come, I might recommend it to my mum. I don't know if that's a good thing, but I don't, I wouldn't, it's not a book that I would be desperate to pass on to people. Uh, um, but there was good things about it. Well, and, and Simon, what, you know, what about you? You're, you're a bookseller. This is a Sunday Times bestseller. Presumably you must have been aware of this book. Uh, yes, it was actually one of our books of the month, and uh, it's one that I thought might be a Marmite book where people will either absolutely love it or absolutely hate it, And but anyone who's prepared to give it a go has really enjoyed it. I think we've got a couple of regulars in the, in the shop who gave it a chance and really enjoyed it. 
but as you've said, it's definitely not your normal narrative structure. So, but because it's done in small chunks, it's you get through it a lot quicker than you than you realise as well. So, but again, um, it is an unusual uh, concept as well. And if you, if you were going to be hand selling this to a customer, how you know, how would you be describing it to them? No, often depends on the customer, but if they're similar age to me and they grew up in those choose your own adventure type books where you're actually involved in the narrative, I think they would definitely enjoy it as well because uh, you are trying to figure out who did it as well as the law students. And then when they do, the, do their chatting with each other, you can go, oh, hadn't thought of that or, oh, yes. So, so again, yeah, the, the essence of it is being slowly revealed as well. I mean, this is the thing, it, it very much reminded me of those Choose Your Own Adventure books. Yes, yeah. you're not flicking back and forward through it, but it's, it's. I mean, I suppose, would you even call this a novel? There's a, there's a question for you. Claire, I'll go to you. Do you. Would you call this a novel? Oh, that's a really tricky question. Yes, it was, because it had a story arc, start, beginning and end. It had protagonists. They all had different parts to play in the narrative yeah I, I i would still call it a novel it's just written very differently it, I, it, it's literally like nothing i've read before but it is the closest i've actually come in a crime novel to looking at how the real thing unfolds when you're either prosecuting or defending a case that's that's what that's what got it for me you, you are sometimes given ten thousand sheets of emails and you're you're reading through it going okay that person knows that person they weren't there that night that's happening and your mind is 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 constantly assessing and reassessing with the information that you've got is it a novel i hope so i recommended it for a book club and i, I guess the same, same question to to, to both uh, simon and, and anna simon you you first what, what do you think do you think of it as a novel yes uh, because well as has already been said, uh, there is a narrative to it. And as you're going through, you're learning more about the situation. So it's definitely a novel, but it's one where you're kind of an integral part to it. And I think it's interesting how two from the law side and two who haven't, that uh, hadn't occurred to me that that is exactly what you would be getting on the law side. You'd be getting these, these papers albeit the opposite way around from the students in the QC. But uh, that definitely does give it a, a go back and reread it type idea as well. But it's definitely one that because you're learning and you're going through, progressing through the story, I definitely think it'd be a novel. And I mean, Anna, the, I guess the challenge for the author, you've got so many different voices that you've got to capture. Do you think she succeeds in making those voices different enough and distinct enough? Yeah, and actually, when you when you look at it, you don't hear from everyone that you think you hear from, and that's one of the tricks that she plays. That you know, it's not until you're quite far into it that you think, "I haven't actually ever heard Sam's voice. I haven't heard Kel's voice. I don't think we ever hear Helen herself. We only hear her through other people." So actually, the core group that you're hearing from are not. There's not that many of them. You just feel that you've met all these people. And I think that's one of the really clever tricks that she pulls off. And I do think it's, I absolutely agree that it's a novel. And I think in some ways it's a classic crime novel because it has got twists and it has got turns. It's got protagonists and it's this mystery of who do you think has done the crime? So although it's written in a very different way to the other books that we are looking at and the other books we've all read, there are elements that are classic crime novels in there. Well, I think it's, it's fascinating. I'll, I'll come back to you with this, Claire. You know, you're involved, as I, as I mentioned in the intro, with, with Murder Island. And, you know, there's almost that way of crime writing and crime stories are just so popular. And we've seen the explosion of true crime podcasts, for instance. So, you know, there's just this incredible appetite. At the same time, how do you advance the form? How do you do something different? And I kind of felt there's similarities between what's happening in this book and what was happening on that the television programme that you've been involved in. I mean, did you feel that? Well, in, in the same idea is that you're putting together evidence as you go along. 
what you're trying to extract from all of these different emails is what pieces of evidence that you can bring out, what you can follow up. And that's exactly what contestants on the show are being asked to do. So, yeah, it, as, as Anna said, I totally agree. It wasn't, a, it wasn't necessarily an easy book to read. But if somebody wants to know what it is actually like when you are looking through all the, the papers and trying to extract information, that's what it's like. And without giving anything away, there are a number of sort of, I suppose, um, there are a number of things that cause you to have to go back and reread some things, <laughs> which is not usual for a novel. And that and that's exactly the same thing that happens in real life. Like at one or two points, I actually laughed to myself as I flipped back and going, oh, that's really, really good. You know, that's really good because you have to go back and reassess. And again, it, it seems quite true to life. Because I mean, that's the thing. It's probably easy to underestimate how difficult it is to assemble this to make yeah. it work, yeah. because it could be a disaster. You know, it yeah. could absolutely fall flat, not work. You know, you've got the front cover of the book is challenging you to solve it. It's billing the book almost as a game. And it's a hard thing for an untried game to work first time. So that, you know, you've got to credit the author. If, you know, if, if, if you all felt that you got that, you know, and I suppose that's the question for all of you. Did you solve it? And did you feel engaged enough in the game that even if you didn't, you felt like you had a chance? I'll, I'll, tell, I'll go to Simon with that first. Yeah, um, I, my first guess was the person who was incorrectly accused. But my second one, my <laughs> second thought was the person who actually did it. So I shan't say, I shan't name names, but That's good. I, was, I was wrong with my first choice and right with the second. Did you read the book with a pen and paper then? R noting down suspects and, and key points? Um... I wish I did. <laughs> I actually read it on holiday, so I didn't really have a, a notebook going next to me, but, uh, but I had more time to read more chunks of it so you got to know the, the characters and also see how the characters are seen by the other characters as well and how they react, because that can also be key in in figuring out and thinking, or, or at least leading me up one direction which I think yeah, was very cleverly done, because as you say, if that was done mm. wrong, if the characters felt flat, it wouldn't have worked, but they work well and how, they, how they're integrated into that society and that village it sort of really worked well. And, and Anna, what about you? Did, you? did you crack the case? No, and I didn't really, I didn't really, yeah, it wasn't the point for me. So, you know, I guess it's not, I think the world, if we, you know, it breaks down into, you know, people who vote independence and not independence or Brexit and not, and people who want to guess before the end of a TV show who's done the murder and those who don't. And I'm definitely someone who just sort of sits back and enjoys the ride rather than trying to constantly work out who has done the crime. So this probably wasn't the book for me in that kind of way. So I was kind of enjoying the meeting the character awful, though they all were. And I was enjoying, you know, I liked... I thought she was making some interesting wider points about society and about class um, in there. But no, so I, can't, I kind of, the, actually the last bit worked the least well for me where it was the unveiling because by that point I was kind of like, let, I cared less because that was obviously the bit where you, you people who sit and want to guess who it is, <laughs> um, that was the bit that I guess was great for that uh, sector of society which I'm not in so um yeah so although I like lots of bits of it I didn't guess who it was and I, I wasn't even that bothered and, and Claire I mean coming to you finally this is kind of your job yeah did you, did, did you get it there's a real opportunity for me to lie and go yeah I got who it was about a third of the way through no <laughs> um I got who the deceased was so mm -hmm. I I guessed who that was going to be, um, but no, I didn't. And that was one of the bits where I was chuckling and had to had to read back through it. I was like, this isn't this isn't very good for the old CV. But uh, that, I mean, that's part of the the real. I mean, Anna and I probably are, are poles apart in terms of the way that we're reading. I'm reading everything for clues all the time, both in my day job and when I'm reading crime novels. So um, I don't tend to let it, uh, as you said, is it the sort of wash over me? I am the sort of, 
underlining and putting down pages and all that sort of stuff. So embarrassingly, no, I did not. But uh, but don't let that put you off. But it's, it's constructed so skillfully that I don't think you can work it out too early, can you? That certainly, that was my feeling, certainly. Yeah, well, what's amazing about it, without spoiling anything at all, is it actually takes you so long to find out there's been a murder. You know, you're, yeah. Yeah. you're quite a significant way. And by that time, I was already invested in the, the story, perhaps in a way that Anna wasn't, wasn't quite so, but I was already utterly invested with the characters and couldn't put it down. Well, I think there's that thing that, you know, a lot of novels in the 18th and 19th century were told through letters. So is it that unusual to be using email as the format? Well, well it's kind of strange because when, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, quite a lot of Dracula is told via stories yeah. uh, and via <clears throat> shipping reports and via, uh, and via those letters. And that's one of my absolute favourites. But um, if you're thinking this is a, a Dracula, it's not. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's, definitely done, it's definitely done in the modern day format of old letters. Frankenstein as well, I suppose, that was done in, in mm. the format of correspondence. 84 Charing Cross Road, which is uh, the oh, yeah. polar opposite of Dracula, and uh, but yeah, was told in a series of letters as well. So from that point of view, but yeah, hearing all those different voices, I think is definitely new. Can I just say that I loved one of the particular um, telephones was always sending strange messages and it's clearly been hacked. It was one of the one of the text message phones always had at the bottom of it, you know, um, by whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that recurring joke all the way through it. I thought that was. I, mean, I, I think it was particularly interesting hearing it read, and I think it must make a wonderful audio book. Yeah. And there's a, a slight part of me that wonders: is it a better audio book than it is a book to read? To let it wash over you, to 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 allow you to spend more time thinking about it. What do you think of that, Simon? Hmm. That'd be an interesting point because I generally do listen to a lot of audiobooks, but this one I read it purely as a text. But because so much of it is emails and WhatsApp messages, it's kind of works well as a as a text book. But I think it would be interesting to hear. You'd need a very good narrator for it, or maybe a wide range of narrators because you'll need a lot of different voices. But um, I think it, yeah, it could work well yeah, either way, but uh, I have to say I did enjoy it as a book, although I do enjoy a good audio book. I mean, it's, it's fascinating that the author's next book is, is in a similar format. Oh, is it? You know, it, it's, it's found material. So th there's almost a sense that, you know, this isn't a one-off for her, that this is the style of how she's going to do things going forward. And I, I, I wonder, you know, I suppose that's the final question before we move on to the next book. For each of you, I'll start with you, Anna. You've kind of said this already, whether you'd recommend it or not. I, I would recommend it to certain people. So, you know, it's not one like we'll go on to the next one. The next one I've already recommended to everyone that I've happened to bump into in the street, um, which gives a clue somewhat of how I felt about it. But, um, and I think, spoiler alert to that. Oh, I know, sorry. <laughs> but this one, this one, I think I'd be a bit more select about who I recommended it to. Um, and I'm just, Simon, I'd be quite interested to know whether you would upsell this to people who bought the, the Tall Quiz Masters book. Who's oh, yes. Name? Surprisingly think... enough, a lot of people who bought um, Richard Osman's The Thirsty that's Murder it, Club sorry. bought this one as well. And I don't know if that's because of the cover mm -hmm. as much as anything, because I didn't yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Claire, would you recommend it? Uh, yeah, definitely would. Probably to other lawyers. <laughs> uh, yeah, recommend, I would recommend it to my pals. Yeah, I, I would. I actually, I know what you you mean, Anna, about the cover because it. it um, but it's very, very different from the Osmond book. It is, but it's uh, a cover that connects. Yeah, That's what would. That, and and maybe that was marketing, but I hope it didn't put the type of people that would enjoy it off. I think law students would really enjoy it. I would recommend it to law students so they can see what kind, kind of thing they were getting involved in. The thing is, I wasn't the ideal law student. As you may have guessed, I did not go on to practice law. So, <laughs> so maybe most law students would, would, would enjoy it. I don't think I'm the, I'm the exemplar. I should say that the next book is Uncovered Audio Files, which again brings us back to the, the audio book, the kind of podcast format. So I think, I think it'll be fascinating to see what she does next 
and how it's received. But obviously, you know, the best way to write a bestseller is to write a bestseller, as I think Dick Francis once said. So she's got off to a good start. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll move on now to our next book. And that is no less than this year's McIlvany Prize winner for, fix, um, for Crime Book of the Year, which is Craig Russell's Hyde. And at the top of the show, I promised you darkness. Well, here it is in abundance. The premise is a, a kind of clever twist on the old Robert Louis Stevenson classic, Jekyll and Hyde. In fact, the book opens with Stevenson in conversation with our main protagonist, a certain Edward Hyde. And he tells Stevenson that he has a gift or a curse because he experiences two realities. One's real and one's a dream world state brought on by a neurological condition. So he's on the hunt for the perpetrator of a series of gruesome murders in Victorian Edinburgh. And he's drawn into a web of Celtic occultism and a cabal of powerful figures. And he has to look into both the real world and his own other world to find the answers. Here, with a short reading, is Craig Russell. Elspeth Lockwood woke into darkness and into fear. Her sense of place, of time, of herself was lost to her. Her disorientation was compounded by her emerging from sleep to wakefulness in total, impenetrable darkness. Pulling herself into a sitting position, she stretched tremulous fingers into tenebrous space. Beneath her, she felt rough sacking on which she had clearly slept. The eyes of her fingertips perceived that the floor beyond the sacking comprised uneven and grimy flagstones. The wall to her side was chill, sleek stone, damp and slimy to the touch. The unstirred air hung frosty and heavy around her with the smell of damp old earth. She was seized with a greater panic upon the realisation of a single fact. She was underground. She could be in a cellar, she could be in a tunnel, she could be in her tomb. For that moment there was no thought, no remembrance. There was no recollection of how she had fallen into the bonds of darkness, no speculations of what fate awaited her beyond it, nor plans to escape it. For that moment, all there was was the moment, and the darkness, and the terror. She peered into the dark, but it refused to yield to perception. She could have been in a space the size of a crypt. She could have been in, this, in a space the size of a cathedral. She could be alone and forsaken, left to perish from hunger and thirst in a crow black dark desert. Or she could be surrounded by others, hungering for blood and flesh. Another dark, cold thought intensified her panic. She might already be dead. She might be condemned to the sepulchral dungeon of her final thoughts and fears. Or this, she thought with cold terror, could be hell. Well, I did say I promised you darkness, so <laughs> I think Craig absolutely delivered, delivered there. Um, before we go on to talk about the book, I just want to ask you each quickly in turn, have you read or when did you last read Stevenson's original inspiration for this, Jekyll and Hyde? Anna, I'll start with you first. Anna, you're muted, I'm afraid. I'm muted because the dog had a moment earlier and started barking, so I muted myself and forgot to unmute. Yeah, I don't think I've read it since either university or six year studies, one of the, which, you know, it will surprise you was some time ago. So yeah, quite a long time ago, but it is a book that lingers. And Claire, what about you? Had you read the original? Yeah, probably not since school. That, that's how long it was. I, I revisited, um, I revisited Dracula and I revisited Frankenstein relatively recently, but I haven't read that, but I'm going to as a result of, of Hyde revisit the story of Deacon Brodie as well. Simon, what about you? Yeah, pretty much the same, many, many years ago. And it's, it's one of those stories that I'm trying to remember what was in the book and what's been sort of used by so many other authors or storytellers and things like that. So I'm trying to, so I want to go back to the original and 
reread it. I mean, it's interesting because I think I didn't read it at school, but I think I read it when I worked in publishing in London about 20 years ago now, 15, 20 years ago. I can't remember very much about it. And I don't remember liking it particularly much either because it's obviously this classic and you feel something you feel that you, you have to read. At the same time, the, the idea within it is so strong and so culturally resonant that so many, particularly crime authors, cite it as the inspiration for everything they do. Things about duality, about double lives, about double worlds. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating basis to use as a spin-off for your novel. And one of the things I really loved about this book in particular was, was the opening. You know, you actually have Stevenson himself meeting Edward Hyde and Hyde telling the story. And I found that so engaging. You know, how, how did you like that opening, Anna? Totally loved it. And it's, it's funny what you're saying about so many authors citing it as an inspiration and it being used so often in popular culture and that when Craig won uh, the McIlvany, I'll be really honest, I was like, I'm not even vaguely interested in reading that, not my kind of thing. Um, and then looked at the list for book club for this month went, oh, turns out I will be reading it. But that's the joy of a book club. You know, I would not have picked up either of these two, first two books that we've talked about and I got something great from both of them. So I loved Hyde, I loved the darkness, I loved his writing. Um, I thought that there was elements of the duality and things that weren't particularly subtle, but uh, but yeah, absolutely drew me in in a way that I really wasn't expecting and really fancied Hyde, which was great as well, um, and all his darkness. So yeah, one of the one of the great books of the year for me. Claire, what about you? How, how did you find that opening? And you've talked about Dracula. We've mentioned Frankenstein. It really reminded me of Frankenstein, actually, that, that opening to the book. Oh, you're muted. You're okay. muted, Claire. Yeah. It wouldn't be a meeting if someone didn't shout that at me at least once. <laughs> um, um, actually, in Dracula, um, there's quite a lot of sitting looking at the sea, especially when Dracula's coming back across the water. So there are quite a lot of two people sitting on benches looking at the sea, and they're looking at the sea when they start. I, like Anna, absolutely loved this book. This would definitely, though, have been an absolute go-to book for me. Anything gothic, anything horror, I am absolutely there for it. So um uh, so so there there wasn't that sort of wasn't that sort of resistance um what i really really loved about it is that he explores every sense with you he talks about uh, smell he talks about taste he talks about touch it's so visceral his writing that that you you really feel it and and you also feel the old town in Edinburgh and I've got a flat in the old town in Edinburgh and I absolutely love it I love it much better than this shiny new town I love the the creeping venals and um the, the scariness the spookiness of it I suppose so um I really really love that part about it as well the way he spoke about the Edinburgh streets because um it's such a gothic place and Simon, what about you? You know, again, that opening, did that grab you from the start? Uh, yes, yes. I really like it when, if something's inspired by something else and they bring the inspiration from that into the storyline as well. So I really enjoyed that bit and the epilogue at the end as well. So sort of really bookended it really nicely. And it's it was awesome. interesting. We've got a couple of comments coming in. I should say, everyone watching, you can send in your, your comments and questions and, and any thoughts. But there's a couple of people. There's Louise Colvin saying that for her, fantastic opening, taking you straight into the tale, fantastic ending to see the scene as you're reading it. And, you know, a couple of people saying for them, it is their, their book of the year, you know, very, very, very clearly. It's, it's a dark and often very gruesome read, though, isn't it? Did it ever get too much for any of you, Simon? Did you, were you OK with the darkness? Yeah, um, so I've really enjoyed some of the, the, the dark books. And as a result, I've bought uh, The Devil Aspect, which I think might be even darker. Because I, <laughs> I sort of missed that one last year during the COVID. So looking forward to reading that. But yeah, it was... So I love the, the gothic elements that... That Craig bring, brings into his books as well, and including his last uh, McIlvany Prize winner as well, which was very gothic but modern day. But this one really takes you to to 
Edinburgh, and I love that phrase that he used in the speak, the eyes and their fingers. You can just imagine the hand searching for things in the dark and it just brought it to life. It's just it's one that you should read by a far side in, in a darkened in a darkened room. You no, know, it's, it's it's almost like we planned it that reading. <laughs> It was it was it was fantastic, and what about Hyde himself, Claire? You know, he's such an interesting character. Did you did, did you find him a sympathetic character? Did you root for him? I, I I did. You know, see what see when the 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 story starts and we find that he isolates himself from the world, that a man of his standing ought to have servants and to assist him with things, but because of his the dreamlike sleeps that he has. Um, and, and the periods of time that he finds missing, he has to do everything by himself because he can't let himself um, be open to the idea that someone might find out what happens to him or what's happening to him. Um, so he, he lives a very, very solitary life. And clearly when he's speaking to his therapist and has to make all these sorts of secret arrangements to get to his therapist, you can see that what he's trying to do is he's trying to live a good life, but deep, somewhere inside him he clearly has an anxiety that that's not the life he's living i thought the the uh, description of him was absolutely fantastic and i mean anna you said you fancied him <laughs> did, I, did, <laughs> did i hear that right yeah. i mean it's it's <laughs> it's i mean it's a really it's a really interesting thing because having spoken to to craig about it you know he did a lot of research into this neurological condition it, you know it's a real condition yeah and what it would do to someone and it's it's a fascinating way to create an origin myth for Jekyll and Hyde, isn't it? Yeah, and he was a fascinating character. And it was um, I read an interview with Craig where he was talking about the fact that they've sold the film rights uh, and who would play this character who has so many aspects to him. And that was a really interesting, you know, whoever I've got in my head doesn't exist in real life. So yeah, I thought um, I thought it was a really creepy book as well. I thought he was kind of a cool creepy character and there were points in reading this you know we'd have to wake my boyfriend up and sort of go you're all right there you know because I was I didn't want to be on my own anymore because it is a scary book um and there were points in it that you're too scared to be sitting in the bed not having someone to talk to anymore so uh, which I think is a sign of a really good crime book when you're really actually creeped out um so yeah and you know we've, we've kind of talked about how viscerally it's realized you know, how the writing just brings you into this world of Victorian Edinburgh. Along with that, any good crime book needs the plot to crack along. For you, did it do that? I mean, Simon, did, you know, in amongst all this kind of the, the, the dressing, if you like, of the setting itself, did the plot still, still propel you forward? Uh, yes, and I think the characters involved in that also did that as well. And as you say, with Craig having done a lot of research there, I want to learn a bit more about the real life characters, such as uh, Dr. Knox as well, and having those characters in and the doctor that, that Hyde goes to, Dr. Porteous. Um, the characters really help move the plot along so that you're not waiting for the next plot point to go. You enjoy spending time with the characters, which uh, I think is always a sign of a good book when you don't want it to end. And then, what about you? You know, what about you, Claire? How did you feel about that? Did you kind of, you know, as well as being immersed in the world, were you was was your mind ticking over oh, trying to work out what was going on and, and who was oh, responsible? Yeah, that, absolutely, you were right in there. You had, you have the, the opening sort of story where he says, "Let me tell you a story." Um, you have a, a miscarriage of justice, a possible miscarriage of justice, where a young man is killed for the murder of a child that sort of just sits in a chapter by itself, slightly uneasily. You then have this really gruesome murder with, you know, he wasn't just killed once, he was killed a number of occasions. And you have this really gruesome um, way that he's that, that the person's found upside down, he's drowned, disemboweled. Um, and, and then you have a man worried that he's lost time and he's in an area near the deceased that he doesn't remember going to. I mean, you know, how can you not just turn over the next page and want to know what happens? It's brilliant. Had, had any of you heard of threefold Celtic death rituals before you read this book? No. 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 Never, never, never no, come across that in any case, Claire. <laughs> no, I hadn't. 
what what I had come across is obviously the true life story of Deacon Brody, mm. the, the the man on whom Jekyll and Hyde was uh, uh, was supposedly based. So there was a there's a true crime story at the base of it all, maybe, um, but no, definitely not the Celtic uh, three crimes. I mean, it's interesting. I think it's something we may come on to talk about with the next book as well, and it's relevant to the first book where inspiration comes from and that kind of merging of real characters real figures real life and fictional characters you know is that something simon that you enjoy when you're reading a book ah uh, yes uh, it's can be a real skill of the author not to put it in your face that this is a real life character but doing it in a way that they belong in the story rather than having been forced in the story, but I think in the case of all these books, well, especially this one and the next one, any real life characters fit in the story up, sort of perfectly. So you're not going, mm, that's a bit odd, but because I have read a few others where it has been a bit crowbarred in a bit more that this is a real life person and it just jars, takes you out of the story. But in this case and in the next book, they're integrated into the story sort of well. So I'm, I'm guessing you're all recommending this. I think that's the that's the vibe I'm getting. Okay, well, I think we can end on that note. An absolute classic, the crime book of the year, and I think well-deserved. Many people on the on the message saying exactly the same thing. Um, apparently, uh, anyone in or near Edinburgh, Craig, is doing an event at Waterstones tomorrow evening to talk about it. So if you're in or around Edinburgh, Go along and you can hear from the man himself. Now we're on to book three, which is our crime classic. Funny to think of this as a crime classic, but it was first published in 1997, which is the year after I left school. So that's almost a quarter of a century ago. Oh God. This book is none other than Ian Rankin's Black and Blue, the eighth Rebus novel, but the one that, as Ian says in his introduction to the 2016 edition, was the breakout book. The one that catapulted John Rebus to an entirely new level of popularity. And the story, the story focuses on the hunt for a copycat a killer, taking his name from the infamous real serial killer Bible John. He's dubbed Johnny Bible. And Rebus is juggling four cases at once. He's facing an internal inquiry and a trial by media over his role in an alleged miscarriage of justice, all in a day's work for Edinburgh's most irascible cop. But before we hear from the panel, here's the man himself, Ian Rankin, with a reading from Black and Blue. Tell me again why you killed them. I've told you, it's just this urge. Rebus looked back at his notes. The word you used was compulsion. The slumped figure in the chair nodded. Bad smells came off him. Urge, compulsion, same thing, is it? Rebus stubbed out his cigarette. There were so many butts in a tin ashtray, a couple spilled over onto the metal table. Let's talk about the first victim. The man opposite him groaned. His name was William Crawford Shand, known as Craw. He was 40 years old, single, and lived alone in a council block in Craig Miller. He'd been unemployed six years. He ran twitching fingers through dark, greasy hair, seeking out and covering a large, bald spot at the crown of his head. The first victim, Reba said, tell us. Us, because there was another CID man in the biscuit tin. His name was McClay and Rebus didn't know him very well. He didn't know anyone at Craig Miller very well, not yet. McClay was leaning against the wall, arms folded, eyes reduced to slits. He looked like a piece of machinery at rest. I strangled her. What with? A length of rope. Where'd you get the rope? bought it in some shop i can't remember where a three beat pause then what did you do after she was dead shand moved a little in the chair i took her clothes off and i was intimate with her with a dead body she was still warm rebus got to his feet the grating of his chair on the floor seemed to unnerve shand not difficult where did you kill her a park where was the park Near where she lived, where's that? Paul Muir Road, Aberdeen. And what were you doing in Aberdeen, Mr. Shand? He shrugged, running his fingers now along the rim of the table, leaving traces of sweat and grease. 
I wouldn't do that, Reba said. The edges are sharp. You might get cut. McClay snorted. Well, it's another, it's another, that's right from the start of the book. It's, it's another great opening, that one, I, I think. You know, I mean, Simon, let's start with you. Did you read this when it first came out back in 1997? Ooh, not immediately. I think it was a couple of years later. And I actually listened to the audiobook first. Uh, so I used to work in a library and it was a couple of miles away. So when I was walking there, I'd have an audiobook on. So I remember listening to it when I was walking there and really enjoying it. And it's kind of odd because I've got a fake memory because I'm sure something happened in my memory that happened in the book. And then when I reread the book, I realised that, no, that didn't happen at all. But yeah, it's a really strong start. And it's one of those things where you imagine in real life cases where you get people like this who are admitting to, to crimes. Uh, don't know how, how spoilery, spoilery I should get on this bit, but, um, but these sort of people who didn't do it, but try and claim their moment in the spotlight and it must be really difficult for the police dealing with these these sort of people. So having that at the beginning mm. sort of takes you through the book. Well, it really it really chucks you right into the middle of it. Gets gets everything in the plot starting to work. You know, I, I, it's a really it's a really compulsive opening. And did you find that, Claire? Yeah, absolutely. You know, right up for miscarriage of justice, false confessions. I was right there already. Um, looking at, yeah, you know, how did she do it? Was he was he tell, was he saying that right? Was that how it happened? Um, absolutely in it. I, I did read it at the time. Um, and I remember, uh, um, I remember it kind of standing out from other books at the time. That that's, it, was, it was in my memory, but it wasn't till I came back and reread it that I realized really how good it was, how, um, how much you 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 really got to sort of engage with engage with the character of Rebus? It, it was a it was a real one where you got to the heart of the man, um, as opposed to just hearing about a, a a who done it or him solving a case. And I think it was it seemed a lot more personal uh, the story of Rebus as he went through it, as well as as well as the the true life crime of Bible John and John and the the fiction Johnny Bible that went through it, I thought it was brilliant. I mean, do, do you think, oh, you know, I mentioned in the intro that this was his breakout book. Do you think he was doing something different here? Do you think he changed how he wrote or do you think it was it was the momentum of everything that had come before and there wasn't anything that different in the writing? Well, I I read, um, the I, I, I listened to this by way of audiobook, so I listened to this when I was out running and there is an audio introduction, uh, a more recent audio introduction by Ian Rankin, who actually, I think, answers that question himself and describes it's about the time in his life that he was going through mm -hmm. and various uh, issues that were going on and, and what, what was happening to him and basically said he was taking it out on the character. <laughs> so, so that was why Rebus was going through a lot as well. But in, in putting him through a lot, um, I mean, you know, he gets beaten up on a number of occasions, well, at least once or twice, you know, puts himself in peril quite badly. Um, and a, a, apparently it appears to be a, a reflection of what Ian Rankin was thinking at that time. But whatever it was that was different, you could really tell when you were reading it. It really, it really made the character of Rebus the central part of the show as opposed to a, a whodunit crime novel. And Anna, what about for you? Did you read it at the time? No, I didn't. I did start to read the Rebus books in order much later. Um, so I, and it's very noticeably a different kind of book. It's a much more complex book. There's lots more layers to it. There's more layers to Rebus, but there's more layers, I think, to the writing as well. And there's more uh, storylines that are brought in. I think the books up to that point, and I'm, you know, it's, it is still quite a long time since I've read them, but they felt like, you know, a fairly straightforward whodunit, as you say, Claire, you know, 
beginning, middle, and end, where this, you know, there was lots of intertwining and lots of coming books coming in, uh, storylines coming in from previous novels and things like that as well. So it did feel like a shift change for Ian Rankin. And it obviously worked. Um, you know, it is a much, I think, a much better book. I still, for me, it still suffered, I think, from reading it again immediately after Hyde, because that, um, that dark underground, you know, historic world was much more kind of engaging than the mean streets of Edinburgh and the criminals who live there and even the mean streets of Aberdeen um, are now. So I, I think, uh, although it is a much more complex book, it still, for me, didn't stand up next to Hyde. I mean, it's, it's interesting. We, you know, for the most recent Bloody Scotland Festival, we, we produced a, a short film where we interviewed a number of different crime writers about their influences and about their latest books and when we talked to Ian you know very much he was talking about how all of his writing is about trying to make sense of Edinburgh as a place it's about mm -hmm. you know, the duality of Edinburgh as a place and, and I should say we'll I'm sure we'll repost the film on the various bloody Scotland social media after this so people people can watch it again and, and hear what Ian says because I think it's very relevant to this to this kind of conversation and, and and this book obviously there's something very interesting he does with this book in introducing Bible John. And Bible John was this real figure, this serial killer, killed, I think it was three people and then disappeared. Disappeared completely, never found. There was DNA trails. The, the case was reopened many times. Do you think that, I mean, unsolved cases are so potent. Do you think that is part of the appeal of this book and part of what maybe sparked Rebus a lot, you know, along with a lot of that kind of yeah. the personality and that and, and the personal explorations. Do you think that's what sparked this into life in, in such a dramatic fashion for him? You know, as he says in that introduction, it took him from a mid-list author into something very different and ultimately into something stratospheric in, in publishing terms. Yeah, I think it probably is something to do with that, but other people have tackled the Bible John story and not had the success. So whatever Ian has done with it in the complexity in this sort of, you know, un uncovering of Rebus in the way that he's done has also been as important as telling the Bible John story. But yeah, people love a true life, true life murder, as we all know. So I think having that, that uh, element to it probably did help. And what, what did you make of that aspect, Claire? Oh, you're, you're muted again. <laughs> Sorry. The idea of the fictional character of Rebus, who doesn't seem fictional at all in the book, he's real to me when I'm reading it, trying to identify who that was is just absolutely brilliant. And, and what's so interesting about it is you're testing yourself again. I, I, I'm testing my own true crime interest saying well, we know he had red hair we know he was tall we know he was softly spoken you know so it's great when you see that weaving through the book and later on at points he meets people one or two of them have red hair you're thinking oh is that him is that yeah. so again I'm starting to realize through this self-analysis that I'm just trying to guess who's done it all the way through constantly ever trying to pit myself against the writer but um I really loved it. One additional thing that I really, really liked about it was now looking back on it, it absolutely is a snapshot of Scotland at a time and Edinburgh at a time, the big oil boom um, that happened. Obviously, that, that boom is no longer up there in Aberdeen. Um, and what I thought was really, really interesting about quite a lot of the, the way through it was, I thought, you know, if people had mobile phones, these these scenes wouldn't be happening because there was quite a lot of there was quite a lot of miscommunications and um, uh, difficulties in between characters where they had to wait for phone calls or had to travel a far distance to get to a phone. And I just thought that was really, really funny. So looking back on it, there's an extra dimension to me about the book, which is that it captures Scotland at, at a time that showed you um, the, the tensions, the, um, the, the business dynamic and stuff like that as well. I thought that was a really, really interesting added layer. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, I have a kind of personal connection to it in a way. It's one of my dad's favourite Ian Rankin books because I was born in Shetland because my dad was involved in the construction of the Sulemvo oil terminal. And of course they go up to Shetland, that, that whole side <laughs> thing, it's fascinating yeah. to see all all of that, all of that play, play out in a book. So, you know, I kind of feel like my life ended up being a slight part of that, of that story. 
Um, I, mean, I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting that you raised there, Claire, is I wonder if this had been a debut novel and he had tried to do what he did with the Bible John character and Rebus trying to work it out. Would that have worked as well? I'm not sure it would have. I mean, what do you think, Simon? It's, it definitely needs a, a skilled author to do that because um, there have been characters who have been based on real life killers in the past, so most notably um, Norman Bates in Psycho and Hannibal Lecter in the, the Thomas Harris books. And they've all grounded in real life people, although in those cases, they've been caught and documented, whereas this case, it's someone who wasn't caught. And again, been skilled to bring that character to life you kind of do need a couple of books under your belt before you're capable of doing that whereas if you're a beginner you might just make him too central to the story rather than having him in the shadows as it were he but, sort of comes and goes in the story and not not the full focus but is it also that you have a relationship with rebus so as claire said the fact that rebus is now trying to work out who Bible John actually was, who this real figure actually was. Just, I mean, it's blurring the lines between fiction and reality again. But I think, I mean, some people don't like that. I think a lot of people really do like that. I mean, is that what worked for you, Claire? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I think it. I think it really, really did. I mean, I I read all these books about Bible John, and um, there was relatively recently a man who was convicted of various murders that was thought to be a possibly Bible John. So I followed that case through the courts. I actually watched some of the trial taking place. So the idea that I was going back to to read someone who who was such a beloved fictional character as Rebus tried to find this person. I I was totally engaged by it. The the um the the other twist is of course the serial killer may have a copycat and isn't happy about it. And I love the idea of the serial killer being put out because someone's stealing yeah. his show. I just thought that was such a, a brilliant idea. You know, and trying to track down who it is and that whole angle um, of it. It's yeah. It's these kind of stories within stories, isn't it? And I think actually all of the books that we've talked about tonight have been those ideas of stories within stories within stories, which, which I think really adds a depth to, 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 to the reading experience. Absolutely. We are, we are almost at time, actually. So we have Lynn Anderson is going to appear and tell us, I think, any second about November's book club. Take it away, Lynn. Hi there, uh, Lynn Anderson here. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks very much. It, that was just wonderful. Uh, right, next, uh, our next book club, Bloody Scotland Book Club, is on the 24th of November with Louise Fairbairn, Jane Hamilton and Craig Sisterton. And the books we're going to talk about, as you can see on the screen now, is The Cutting Room, which we regard as a classic by Louise Welsh, Natural Causes, which was the first book of James Oswald's long running and hugely popular series, and Winter Counts, a debut by David Heska Wanbly. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks very much, Lynn. Well, we're, we're, our hour is up, I'm afraid. It was fantastic talking to everyone about these books. I think we've had a great selection tonight. I hope everyone goes away and reads them and lets us know what they think, because they won't be for everyone. Um, but it's been it's been great to, to talk through all of them tonight. It's been great to talk to our fantastic panel, Claire Mitchell, Anna Day, Simon Lloyd. Thank you to everybody. Tune in, in on November the 24th for the next book club and good night. Goodbye. <laughs>